You're listening to a message from the pulpit of Rolling Hills Baptist Church, located in Verona, Pennsylvania. Today is July 20th, 2014. Men of Athens, meet the God of gods. You have all these idols and all these objects of your worship. You have all of this. And you have all these little teeny tiny gods. And this God can do this thing, and that God can do that thing, and this goddess can do this. And, and, and each goddess has, or God has their speciality. He said, but you know what? I'm introducing you to a God who can do it all. A God who is not limited. The God of your gods. The God of all things. The only one who is worthy of your worship. Paul presents to these intellectual elites the God who is powerful enough to invent the whole world and everything that's in it. And not only invent it, not only create it, but then to give it life, right? To, to give life and breath to everything. I can stand in front of you this morning and tell you that I am absolutely unworthy to preach this message. Because I can look back at my life, I can look back at this past week. Did anybody, did you go home and, and did it ever resonate or, or register with you that, oh, I'm valuing this more today than I am God? Paul gives them a different picture. He says, my God is a big God, bigger than all your gods. He tells them in verse 24 that his God, the God, does not live in a temple, right? He says, does not live in a temple built by hands. God cannot be contained by any structure or any building or any box that we want to put him in. He tells him, you can't be contained by any temple that you build, by any structure that you create, by any idol that you make, by any altar that you build. He cannot be contained by those. He's too big. Your life might have looked like Athens this past week. You might have had all kinds of idols pop up for you. You might have had all kinds of objects of worship pop up for you. You may as well have had a little statue there that said that. It said, unknown God, because the creator of all things was unknown to you this week. You're not alone in that. I believe the most important reason that he seeks after us is because he knows who he is, and he knows that we need him. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as uh, in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to, the, to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this, te- what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Preceding is today's key scripture reference of Acts 17, 16 through 23. Here's Corey with part two of a message titled, True Worship, subtitled, One True God. All right. So how's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing good? I'm rested. I slept a little better this week, so I, did, I had a hard time going to sleep last night, but... Uh, other than that, I'm all right. Um, it's because I was excited about today. Uh, nervous, probably more like it, more accurate. Um, yeah, so if, if you remember last week, I um, started uh, a, a new series on uh, worship. And the, one of the things that I, I put forth last week was that I believe that everybody worships. Every person created past, present, and will be created in the future worships. Um, I believe it's just a a part of how we were created and a part of who we are. The question is, what do we worship? Um, 
or who do we worship. And uh, the, there's a lot of different definitions for worship. I read a few of them last week. Uh, the one that I, I kind of, uh, I guess, rested on, if that makes sense, is, uh, is the one that says um, worship is our response to what we value most. Because I, 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 I like that one. It's very simple. It's very to the point. And I think there's, there's a lot of truth in it that the things that we worship are the things that, that we value the most, whether it's, it's, a, it's what we spend our time on, our energy, our money. Uh, it's what we, uh, what, what we yearn to do. You know, one of the things I said last week was, you know, the thing that we worship the most is that thing that we can't do without. It's, it's the thing that when we don't have it, uh, we look forward to being with it again. Or uh, it's the thing that we yearn for, that we long for, that we, that we have this urging to be with or around. And that could be any number of things, whether it's a, a job or a person or, you know, an object that you have, or it could be any number of things that the, the, uh, the, the objects of worship are numerous, and they're not, uh, really not limited at all, I don't believe. Uh, the, the verse that we, or the passage of Scripture that we looked at was um, Jesus, when he, remember, he got to the well uh, with the Samaritan woman, and, uh, and he had a discussion with her, and we saw in that passage that even though the Samaritans initially they set out to worship the one creator Jehovah that they actually had two things that got in the way two major issues that got in the way number one was if you remember they are arguing with the Jews about where God should be worshipped you know the Samaritan said no you have to worship God at Mount Gerizim the Jews said no you have to worship God in Solomon's temple and, and so what, is, what does that tell me well that tells me that both the Jews and the Samaritans, it seemed that what they valued more than the object of worship, who should the one who should be the object of our worship, there are more. They, what they valued more was where he was worshipped, and I think that comes down. That goes back to uh, maybe what they really worshipped was their own pride, because it, it comes down to an issue of, you know, I'm right and you're wrong. You know, we have the right place, you have the wrong place. And it comes down to a thing of pride. And number two, the other big issue that they had was the Samaritans, over time, they allowed uh, other cultures to come in and, and, and they, 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 uh, they brought in people from other cultures and they married in and they brought other deities. They brought foreign deities in, all right? And so they had these gods that they worshipped and these other various religions that came in and became a part of who they were and they became this mishmash of religions in a lot of ways. And so it wasn't just, you know, what the response to what they value most, but it was who they were worshiping, right? They, were, they began to worship false gods. They began to worship false idols. Two big things that got in their way. I do believe that we all worship someone or something, whether you're religious or not. And I believe that instinctively as people, we know that there's something more, right? Uh, now, if, if you... Uh, if you talk to any number of people, they'll say, well, I don't think there is anything more in life. This is it. And to that person, I say, well, you have no ambition, so do you just sit home and twiddle your thumbs all day long? So what do you do? You know, what is your pursuit in life? And the thing is, the reason that I believe that I know that we all know that there's something more to this life than just what we have, whether we're Christian or not, whether, we're, whether, whether we are religious or not, is because we're all in pursuit of something. We're all in pursuit of something that's bigger than ourselves, something that's better than ourselves. We're, we're looking to improve ourselves in one way or another. And, and I think that's why we have so many world religions. I think that's why we have so many cults that crop up. I think you see it in, uh, it for, for non-religious people, you see it in the pursuit of power, position, office, money, politics. Uh, you see it in, in, the, in the desire for fame and for glory for themselves. The pursuit of something more. There's got to be something more than what I have right now. Because what I have right now just isn't good enough. And so I think we all worship something or someone. And we all know there's something to pursue. There's something better. There's something bigger in life. It's one reason why I believe that evangelism is so critical. For us as followers of Christ 
because people are searching. There's a lot of students at Pitt that are searching for something. A lot of them don't know what they're looking for. They haven't figured it out yet, but they're searching. So in the book of Acts is where we're, we're going to be today. If you want to go ahead and turn to Acts 17. The book of Acts is really it's a, um, it's a, a historical overview or, uh, of the growth of the early church. So we, we take the first church and we read Acts and we see kind of the growth and how it expanded and how God used it. And, uh, and in chapter 17, so we're going to start in verse 16, uh, we read about Paul entering the city of, uh, of Athens. And uh, the reason Paul entered the city of Athens was because if, uh, a few verses earlier, if you read, he was in Berea or in Macedonia. And uh, uh, the Jews, he was preaching the gospel, as Paul does. And the Jews came in, and they were starting to stir things up and starting to agitate. And so Paul became in some physical danger. So his, uh, his Christian brothers, they, they grabbed him, and they took him out of the city, and they brought him to Athens. And they said, all right, you sit here, and Silas and Timothy are coming. You wait for them. All right? And so Paul is in this city of Athens, and um, if you know anything about the, the history of Athens, it was uh, an intellectual epicenter of the world, okay? Uh, the city of Athens began, um, well, a long time ago. <laughs> uh, there, was a young, there was a man named Theseus, and he was a hero of a nearby city, and so he started, he founded this new uh, community, this new town, if you will, and he named it after the goddess Athena, so he named it Athens. And very quickly, Athens grew. It was in a very favorable spot um, geographically. It was about five miles uh, inland off the coast. It was surrounded by, uh, by, three mount by mountains on three sides, and, uh, and so it was a nice location, and it grew, and it grew quickly, and it grew economically, militarily, politically. It became a very important city-state, and, uh, and so... Uh, the Persians invaded. They tried to invade Greece. Athens was very instrumental in uh, holding off the Persians. And uh, that was the uh, early part of the 5th century B.C. And then you get to the mid-late part of the 5th century B.C. And uh, the Athenian ruler at the time was Pericles. And Pericles went on this big building binge, okay? He started spending all kinds of money. Athens had all kinds of money to spend. And he starts building all these temples and all these structures and all these very fa uh, fantastic, magnificent, huge buildings, right? Uh, make, creating all these altars to the gods. And uh, this is when the Parthenon was built, right? And we all, we've all seen pictures of the Parthenon. We know about the Parthenon. And, uh, and so this is the time that the Parthenon was built. As he built all of this, what began to happen was, uh, well, intelligent people started to come. And that was his purpose. He wanted to draw in the intellectual elite of the world. Literature came, science came, philosophy came. And so you had a city, uh, a city that was growing. In the midst of this rise to power, uh, Athens began to kind of upset some of the surrounding city-states. And so they teamed up with Sparta. We all know about Sparta, right? The, the warrior clan, the warrior city-state. And, uh, and they in a, got into a 27-year war with Athens, the Peloponnesian War. And at the end of the 27 years, Athens was basically destroyed. Um, they lost a lot of their population. They lost their power. They lost their military. They lost their political influence. They lost their economy. It was in ruins. The one thing, however, that survived was the intellect, the intellect and the culture of the city. That stayed intact. And it continued to stay intact. In 338 BC, uh, a man named Philip II of Macedonia came in and he sacked Athens. He invaded and conquered Athens. And why was this important? Because his son was Alexander the Great. We all know who that is. Alexander fell in love with Athens, fell in love with the culture of Athens. And so as he went from nation to nation conquering people groups, he spread the Athenian culture with him. And so the invasion of Philip II actually turned out to be one of the best things for Athens. In 146 B.C., they were invaded again. They were conquered again, this time by Rome. Rome loved all things Greek, all right? In some ways, Rome modeled itself after Greek culture. 
And Rome was known anyway for being a very uh, benevolent conqueror, if you will. I mean, they allowed uh, uh, cities and, and nations to maintain their, their political structure, their cultural structure. They didn't come in and say, you have to change. Basically, they just wanted your money, right? They conquered you, and they wanted you to pay taxes to them. And so, uh, and so the Athenian um, culture and intellect continued to flourish. And so then we come to Acts 17, and, and Paul arrives here, okay? And when Paul arrives, the city of Athens had been the intellectual epicenter of the world for 500 years. Let that sink in for just a little bit. 500 years, they had been the spot to go to if you were a smart person for 500 years. Our country is what? Not even 250 years old yet? Think about that for a minute. And so Paul gets there, and he travels through the city, and he finds it to be the city that is rife with idols and false worship. And so we start in verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as uh, in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to, the, to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this, te- what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. In verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of, objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. And so in Athens, Paul finds a multitude of idols, enough that Luke records that he said it was a city full of idols. And the author Luke says that Paul was upset by this. The NIV translation says that he was greatly distressed, and that's kind of the nice way of saying it. The, the Greek word here is the Greek word uh, paroxnuo, and, and it means to, to burn with anger, to be provoked, to scorn. It means this dude was mad, all right? As, as Paul walked through the city of Athens, he was angry, all right? He, he, he was sit there, dropped there, said, okay, you wait for Silas and Timothy. But if we know anything about Paul, we know that Paul wasn't the kind of just to kind of sit there and twiddle his thumbs, right? Paul was going to get out and do. He was going to go, and he was going to walk and talk to people. And so he walks around, and he sees idol after idol, and object of worship after object of worship, and he began to despise what he was seeing. He was angry. He hated the culture around him. He was spiritually repulsed by the culture that he saw. Now, mind you, he's... I don't want you to hear me wrong on that, okay? He was not repulsed by the people. I think we need to make that clear. What he, was, what he found repulsive or what angered him was what was the objects that he saw, the culture that he saw around him. In our, Christian, our Christianese, we like to make the cliche, uh, hate the sin, love the sinner. That's kind of what, uh, where Paul was. And Luke starts verse 17, he, well, he says that uh, he was greatly distressed to see, uh, um, to see the city was full of idols. And then verse 17, he says, so he reasoned in the synagogue. We kind of overlook a lot of the connecting words in Scripture, right? Uh, we see the word so, and we don't think anything about it. The word so here is actually important because in, in the Greek language, the word that's used here for so is actually one that sets up a brand new scene, okay? So it wasn't that... Um, that Paul was walking through the city and wandered and getting mad and wandered into the synagogue and started talking to people, it sets up a brand new scene, okay? It would be like watching a TV show or a movie, right? And you're watching, you know, this guy, I don't know, 
running away from this other guy trying to catch him, right? And then it cuts to another scene where, you know, whatever else. And so the word so here means it's a brand new scene. It's a new day. It's a new time. It's, uh, it's not sequential or not one right after the other, if you will. And so the chances are, it says that he, so he reasoned in the synagogue. So the chances are is that Paul waited until the Sabbath. He kind of walked around Athens. We don't know what day he arrived in Athens, but whatever day it was, he walked around Athens, kind of soaked in the thing, soaked in, saw what he saw, uh, tried to absorb it, tried to pray, I'm sure. And then he goes into the synagogue. And the Spirit begins to move, and he says, the, Luke records that he tried to reason with or, or, or converse or discuss with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, and this is who he talked to first. But this wasn't enough for Paul. Because it says he reasoned with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day. Sometimes it's easy to have discussions with people of a similar mindset or a similar take on religion, if you will. Uh, it's uh, just from my experience, it's a lot easier to sit down and have a conversation about God, about spirituality, about religion with uh, someone who is Jewish than it is to sit down and have a discussion about those same things with someone who is uh, atheistic or agnostic in their philosophy. It's easy. It's, uh, it's not super easy. I mean, at some point when you're talking to a Jew, you get to, to, the, to the subject of the Messiah, right? And, and what they believe and what we believe. But it's still a similar mindset. And sometimes it's easy to stop with those people who are, believe similarly to what we believe. But for Paul, that wasn't enough. It says he went to the marketplace and he talked to whoever happened to be there. The marketplace in Athens was a happening spot. Okay, this is, this is probably the highest concentration of people. It would be like for us today, it would be like going to the mall on a Saturday kind of thing. Lots of people, lots of people around, uh, walking around different shops and stuff. All the storefronts were in the marketplace. It's where the people were. And so as he's walking through, he runs into a couple of groups of philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And they begin to dispute with them. The Epicureans, um, they, were, they were founded by uh, the Greek philosopher Epicurus. He came after Socrates and Plato and, and Aristotle. He was uh, actually a, um, one of their students. And so um, the Epicureans, they believe, and, and nothing but pleasure, right? All about pleasure. Life is all about getting as much pleasure as you can. It's a very pragmatic philosophy. And they, you know, no, no pain, no fear, no anxiety. Just get all the pleasure that you can get. And, and they didn't necessarily believe that there was no God. Um, they believed that, that, the, that if there were gods, that the gods really didn't care about humanity, right? So God's not, the gods are not involved in the day-to-day the -day lives of the people. Uh, and then there were the Stoics. And the Stoics believed, um, well, they believed that you should live harmoniously with nature, right? They were tree huggers. No offense to anybody that may be a tree hugger, all right? They, uh, they, 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 they very much believed that man should work, one, uh, should work hand in hand with nature, okay? And, um, and they also believed in individual self-sufficiency. So you shouldn't rely on anybody else. For your, for, for your needs, okay? You're self-sufficient all on your own. They believed that there was a God. And they would believe what we would call today pantheism, right? That, the, that God is the soul of the world. Or that the manifestation of God comes through the universe, through nature, through the world. So if you worship a tree, you're worshiping God. If you worship a mountain, you're worshiping God. Whatever is in nature that you worship, as long as it's natural, if you worship it, you're worshiping God because God is in a tree, God is in a molehill, you know, God is in uh, a mountain, God is in a stream, God is in a blade of grass. You know, God is in all of nature. And that's how they viewed it. And so these philosophers, they disagree with Paul. They have a problem with him. They begin to dispute with him. And they even, they even begin to condescend with him, right? They said, who is this babbler? Right? The word babbler here it means empty talk or empty conversation. It, words that mean nothing, right? Um, and so they, uh, they, 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 they disagree with Paul. They don't like what he's saying. 
and they decide to bring him to the Areopagus. I kind of think they were doing this as a joke. This is like a, a prank they were playing on Paul in order to mock him or make fun of him. Uh, because the Areopagus was, well, it was an elite group of men within the city of Athens. It was the, uh, the city judicial council, kind of like the city council, if you will. They, and, and what the Areopagus was, uh, would do is they would make rulings over the, the religious and educational activities within the city. Okay? And so they bring Paul in front of it, uh, probably because, well, they think he's a babbler. They think he's speaking a bunch of nonsense. And so they bring him in front of these uh, intellectual elites and say, you know, here, Paul, talk to these guys. And Paul begins to speak to them. Of all the idols that he saw in Athens, there was one that captured his heart. And it's the one he spoke of. It's the one that he started with. He says, you have all these idols. He says, but I found this one that was to an unknown God. Standing before a very important group of men in Athens, you can almost sense Paul kind of <sighs> taking a deep breath, preparing himself as he goes into this. And he begins to unfold this mystery of the unknown God that they have. And in verse 24, he says that this unknown God is, is the God who made the world and everything in it. He said that this unknown God is the Lord of heaven and earth. He said that this unknown God, uh, he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Paul stands before the ultra elite in the world of intellectualism, and he says, men of Athens... Meet the God of gods. You have all these idols and all these objects of your worship. You have all of this. And you have all these little teeny tiny gods. And this God can do this thing. And that God can do that thing. And this goddess can do this. And, and, and each goddess has, or God has their speciality. He said, but you know what? I'm introducing you to a God who can do it all. A God who is not limited. The God of your gods. The God of all things, the only one who is worthy of your worship. And notice that, that Paul knows his audience here, right? I think sometimes we need to be mindful of our audience whenever we're speaking to somebody about Christ. He doesn't, Paul doesn't jump into Jewish history here, right? He doesn't start quoting Jewish scriptures. He's done it in the past, and it's worked. So why does he need to do it now? Because he's in Greece. <laughs> he's in Athens. And these people have never heard of his little piddling religion of Judaism. They've never heard of these holy scriptures that you speak of. They haven't heard of these things. They don't know them. Instead, Paul just goes right to the heart of what prodded at him, what captured him. This one altar. He went right to the one that had the inscription, Agnosto Theo. And he used that idol, that altar, that inscription. He used to introduce his call to these philosophers and these city administrators to repentance. In one aspect, Paul is speaking to them and uh, proclaiming the word to them in order to gain permission to speak throughout the city of Athens, right? Because these guys could censor him. These guys, they make the rulings on religious activity. And, and they want to know, what are you talking, what do you have to say? What are you talking about? What is this new idea that you have? Because their reputation as a center of intellectualism rides on what they allow to be spouted in their city, so on one hand, Paul is speaking to them because he's trying to gain permission. And yet on the other hand, his heart is to lead them to the work and the person of Jesus Christ as the apex of the redemption of all of mankind, including them. As it turns out, the city of Athens was, was right all along. There was 
another God. They had this altar to the unknown God or to an unknown God. And they were right. There was a God to them that was unknown. There was another God to worship. And this God that Paul presents to them was and is greater than all of their idols and higher than all the objects inhabiting their altars. Greater even than Athena herself in the Parthenon. In their search for something to worship or something to adore, Paul presents to these intellectual elites the God who is powerful enough to invent the whole world and everything that's in it. And not only invent it, not only create it, but then to give it life, right? To, to give life and breath to everything. Paul is giving them a very different picture of worshiping and a different picture of the gods that they had had before. It's just one God, he says. It's not all these other gods you have. It's not all these other idols that you put up for worship. We have a tendency to put up idols. I can stand in front of you this morning and tell you that I am absolutely unworthy to preach this message. Because I can look back at my life. I can look back at this past week. Did anybody, did you go home and, and did it ever resonate or, or register with you that, oh, I'm valuing this more today than I am God? I'm worshiping this rather than God. This is what I place value on. I think by now you guys know not to put me on a pedestal, right? But I know sometimes we like to put preachers on a pedestal. There was many times over this week, and, I, and as I prepared for this message, that I kept sitting back and going, I'm a hypocrite. Because of what I preached last week, here I am this week. And at this very moment, this is what I value more than the one who gives me life. We have to be very careful because we all have a tendency to allow idols to rise up in front of us. Sometimes we know it. Sometimes we're, we, we accept it. Sometimes we're like, yes, I want to pursue that idol. Other times idols just crop up in front of us and we don't even know it. And we begin, you know, worshiping these gods, if you will, rather than the one who created us to begin with, rather than the one who yearns to be with us. Than the, rather than the one who desires intimacy with his kids, with his creation. And we know that that's not who he wants us to be or what he wants for us. But we're not perfect. Paul gives them a different picture. He says, my God is a big God bigger than all your gods. He tells him in verse 24 that his God, the God, does not live in a temple, right? He says, does not live in a temple built by hands. God cannot be contained by any structure or any building or any box that we want to put him in. He tells him, you can't be contained by any temple that you build, by any structure that you create, by any idol that you make, by any altar that you build. He cannot be contained by those. He's too big. It cannot be contained by, by any church building that we construct. I remember being told as a little boy when I was growing up, you know, stop running in church. This is God's house. Any of you ever hear that? Shh, quit being so rowdy. Calm down. Quit talking so loud. This is God's house. All right? We were told it's God's house. Can I tell you something? This isn't God's house. Now, I'd be kicked out of a lot of churches in the South for saying that. This isn't God's house. Look around you. You see these walls? The windows? The HVAC stuff? The, 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 the ceiling? You see all this? Can I tell you something? This is not God's house. Can I be quite frank with you? God doesn't really care about this house. 
He doesn't care about this building. God's house is right here. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. As a Christ follower, you are the temple. I can almost guarantee you, God doesn't care about what the color of the carpet is. He doesn't care whether they have chairs or pews. He doesn't care whether they have a worship band or a piano and an organ. He doesn't care what flowers grow outside. He doesn't care if we have projector screens. He doesn't care what it looks like in here. What he cares is about is what does it look like inside of your heart? This is not his house, although I think it makes for a, a, a fun image or a funny image, I guess. If this is God's house, you know. Remember how Bill used to sit at the back back there and shake hands as everybody went out the door? Could you imagine God sitting back there? Oh, good to see you. I hope you enjoyed the message today. Have a great week. God bless you. Oh, wait, I'm God. Just bless you. All right? And, and, and do we think that, you know, that God just watches us all drive off and goes around, locks the doors, turns down the air conditioner, turns the lights off, kicks back and chills out for a week until we come back? Is that who God is? Is that what he does? God isn't waiting for us to come back the next Sunday so he can unlock the doors, turn the lights on, and welcome us back. And say, hey, it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming. I'm glad you came to see me today. Of course that's not God. Why is that not God? Because he's always with us. God is huge, right? God cannot be contained by any temple built by hands, and it doesn't matter how big or vast or magnificent the temple is. I've seen pictures of this place when y'all moved in, in September of 05. This place looked like a pile of junk. I mean, it was terrible looking. It was not taken care of, let me just tell you. I mean, it looks great now, right? God doesn't care. He's not into the green carpet and the chairs. He is the creator of all things. He is the initiator of all things. And Paul is trying to help the Athenians understand that the God that they didn't know was way too vast to be stuck inside of some building or represented by some altar or some statue or some idol. He's far too interested in our lives. He was far too interested in their lives to simply be reduced to some deity that washed over them or watched them walk by. He's more than worthy, more worthy of just one hour of our time, one and a half hours of our time, one day a week. God doesn't sit at the front of the church and watch us drive away He inhabits our hearts. You know, and maybe the question is, well, if he can't be contained by any building, then how can he be contained in a heart? Well, who created what? Man built this. God built this. God can reside in a structure that he created, not one that I created or that we created. Paul tells the Areopagus that this agnostotheo, this unknown God, is the all-sufficient God, and that he doesn't need a single thing. God made the world. He made everything in it. And he wants us. He wanted the people of Athens. Do, you really, do we think it's an accident that the Jews came to Berea and started stirring up trouble against Paul and that Paul just ended up in Athens? Is it an accident? I don't believe so. God wanted them to know that there is something bigger, better, constant, consistent, eternal, endless, everything. He is the endless supply of life. He is the endless supply of breath. He offers all that we need. Paul tells this council in verse 27, that God made every nation of mankind for what? So that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. The word there for, for reach, 
Um, I, I like other translations better because where, where, the, they use the word grope because in the, in the Greek language, the word here for reach is really what it means. It means, it means groping. When we grope for something, we, we grope for things that we, we, we're searching for. It's like you get up in the middle of the night, right, and it's pitch black dark outside. And so it's pitch black inside, and you don't have any night lights. And, and what do you do? You kind of grope around your house and hope you don't for, didn't forget something on the floor and stub your pinky toe against it and say words you shouldn't say, right? It's kind of that, that groping, this idea of, of seeking, of reaching out for something. Paul wanted them to know that there was someone bigger. No wonder the world is filled with worshipers. Every one of us is created with a soul that was designed to seek after God. And yeah, you know, remember last week I said that, uh, you know, we have to deal with Romans. And when Paul says that no man seeks after God, well, if no man seeks after God, then how in the world do all men seek after God? Because that's how we were designed. It's not to say that, the, that sin and the fall of man came into pl- doesn't come into play. Sin and the fall of man comes in, and that's what causes us to not seek after him. But the way that we were designed, the way that we were created by the creator was to seek him, to adore him, to worship him, to reflect back to him his glory. That was the purpose. We were designed to search for something new, for something bigger than us, for something better than us, for something that matters. If you've wrestled with truth, it's okay. Right? Sometimes we we tend to think that we shouldn't wrestle with, when I say truth, I mean this, capital letter truth. We shouldn't wrestle with this. Sometimes we think we shouldn't wrestle with God. It's okay to wrestle with truth. We all do it to some extent. You're not alone. If you feel like you've been walking through this murky, dark night, groping, trying to feel for something that you can't find, it's okay. Because you're not alone. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how close your relationship with Christ is. You're going to come to a point in your life where you're walking through the darkness, groping, seeking, praying for the Lord to reveal himself to you. It's called the valley. It's a dark place. And if that's where you are, it's okay. Because you're not alone. Sometimes the journey to God, sometimes the journey with God, can feel like we're just groping. And that's why I find it very comforting to know that God is seeking us as well. It's not just us being created to seek him us being created to worship and adore him it's not just us groping through the night to find him we don't have a God who's just sitting up there in heaven kick back chillaxing you like that word he's not just sitting up there saying yep you're getting cold you're getting colder warmer you're getting warmer now. Oh, you're really hot. Oh, you made the wrong turn. Now you're ice cold again. He's not just up there sitting back waiting for us to find him. We have a God who seeks after us. We have a God who desires a relationship with us, and he seeks us for a variety of reasons, one of which is so we can know what we were created to do. 
There's a lot of us, we don't have a clue what we were created for. Go walk out into your community, your workplace. Go to a college campus. And you find a lot of people who have no idea what they were created for. Especially on the college campus. What's your major? I don't know. What's your major? Well, it's this now, but it was this last semester, and it was that the semester before. They don't know what they're created for. They don't know what their purpose in life is. God wants us to know that we were created to reflect His glory, to worship and adore Him. He seeks us so that we can find Him and so that He can become what we value most in life. For that to at least be the pursuit of our hearts. You know what? Your life might have looked like Athens this past week. You might have had all kinds of idols pop up for you. You might have had all kinds of objects of worship pop up for you. You may as well have had a little statue there that said that, that said unknown God because the creator of all things was unknown to you this week. You're not alone in that. And part of God's purpose in making himself known to us and seeking us is to remind us that despite all the objects that pop up, despite all the idols that pop up, no matter how much our lives look like Athens, He is supposed to be our object of worship. I believe the most important reason that He seeks after us is because He knows who He is and He knows that we need Him. He knows that we cannot live without Him. And I mean live. I don't mean draw breath into your lungs on a daily basis. I mean live. One day this world is going to disappear and all things in it. Everything is going to fade away. And when that vapor and the wind is gone, what is left? And that's why Jesus came. And that's why he came willingly. Because God created us, seeks after us, pursues us. Isn't that amazing that the God who created all things pursues us? That his Holy Spirit comes after us and draws us to him? That he chooses us? that he has elected us. The sovereign God of the universe, one who created Canis Majoris, the one who created whatever the one is that's bigger than Canis Majoris that we found now. That God, that is the one who pursues you. That is the one who desires relationships with us. That is the one who seeks after us. That is the one who sent his son to die for us. That for, Jesus came and he said, I am willing to go. And I, and I know what my life is going to be. And I know what my death is going to be. And I know what my purpose is. Because, Father, they can't live without you. Christ came to connect us to the Father. Can I tell you who God worships, or not God worships, but who God values most? Who does God value most, or what does God value most? This is the audience participation part of our program. He values you. He values me. He values the ones into whom he breathed his life. That is what he values most. 
our response to that is to make him what and whom we value most. There's going to be idols. There's going to be things that come up. How do I know this? Because the last time I checked, there's no Jesus in here. He's not sitting in this congregation. I'm not speaking to him. I'm speaking to a room full of sinful, fallible, mistake-driven human beings who make the wrong decisions on a regular basis. Right? The difference between us and the rest of the world outside those doors is that we've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. That is the only difference. Let's pray. Father, I think if each one of us could stand and pray this morning honestly, I think that we would each plead for forgiveness for having idols and other things come up in our life that we place more value in than you. That we adored more than you. Father, I stand up here this morning and I count myself absolutely unequivocally unworthy to stand and to talk to anybody about what it means to worship. Because I see the struggle in my own life to tear down the idols and the impotent little insignificant quote-unquote gods that have come up and that rear their ugly heads at me. Father, I I pray for us, for for this church, this body of believers, this group of people, for these children of yours, I pray for us that you would help us to combat all the idols that come up, all the things that we worship throughout our day and throughout our week, all the things that we find more valuable, that we spend more time on or more energy with or, than we do in reading your word, communing with you, talking to you, listening to you. I pray for us. And all the times that our lives look like little microcosms of Athens. And I pray, Father, that that when we look at our lives and that when we see those things, that we would have the same response that Paul had to be spiritually repulsed by what we see And I pray that it doesn't drive us to depression or that it doesn't drive us to uh, uh, thinking poorly of ourselves or or beating ourselves up or any of that. Because it's so easy to look at that and say, oh, God, I can't come to you right now. I've got all these things, and, and I need to clean up before I come to you, before I come to your throne. And that's not what you want. As we look around and we get angry at what we see, we get spiritually angry at what we see in our lives, help us to come to you. And I pray that the very attitude of our hearts would be one that would prostrate itself at your feet with sincerity, with transparency, with vulnerability. Remind us that, quite frankly, you don't care whether we're laying on our face or on our knees or standing up or sitting down, as long as our, if our heart is not where it should be. If our heart is not in pursuit of you, those things don't matter. So I pray that it is our heart that kneels before you and our heart 
that prostrates before you, pleading for your redemption, pleading for your renewal. God, make us new. Show us who matters. We think a lot of things matter in life. And yet there's only one who really matters. That you would make us, that you would make yourself the object of our affection. Visit us on the web at www.rhbcpitpitt.com or drop in for a visit at 120 Gurnert Drive, Verona, PA, 15147. Service time is 10 a.m. on Sunday. Send us a message via email to Rolling Hills Baptist at comcast.net or reach us by phone at 412-795-1133.